Hey, wonderful person, it's story time, and today we're going to tell a beautiful story on how the narcissist's flying monkeys came back and apologized to the person they were trying to gaslight. But before we get into it, like and subscribe. I'm truly grateful for everybody who has subscribed and everybody who's going to subscribe because it really helps the channel and gets the message out to everybody. Because this story starts with somebody who didn't know that their friend was a narcissist and didn't know the red flags. They didn't have enough information. Now today, the message is getting out and people are learning, but back in the day, not so much. So there was a narcissist once upon a time and they burned through all their relationships, big time. Debts, uh, they owed everybody, they owed the government, everybody. And so the narcissist figured, well, look, if I leave the state and cut off all contacts, I don't have to pay back a lot of the people that I owe money to, and I can start a new life. So the narcissist reached out to her friend and said, you know, can I stay at your place? And the friend said, yeah, sure, you can stay at my place put down no boundaries, right? Three months, three weeks, whatever. The narcissist packed their bags and moved on down south and cut off all contacts with everybody in the north. Not because she didn't like those people, but because she owed them money. And, you know, narcissists, they've burned through more than their fair share of relationships. They kind of have to. So she came down south and moved into her friend's third bedroom. Again, no uh, boundaries were set for this relationship, and it is a relationship. There was no rent, but there were no time limits either. <clears throat> yeah, so <laughs> that's not good. The narcissist has something that they think of as implied consent. That's a legal term, but basically what it means is that when you put up with whatever they're doing, it implies your consent to more of it or an upgrade in it. So if you put up with their BS, it implies that you want more BS. That's the narcissist's mind. And it's a legal term. The, the law and narcissism, they go together, unfortunately, a little too well. But I digress. So the narcissist moved into the comfortable third bedroom and set up camp in there and started living her life. Which honestly, because there was no pressure on her to do anything, didn't get a job in the new state and didn't even try. And just kind of wandered around in life and got out and explored the community. And now since the narcissist had extra money. She had income from somewhere. I forget what it was. It wasn't a whole lot. It wasn't like she was going to be able to live on it forever, but she had enough that she could explore the community, put gas in her car, that sort of thing. Oh, and the narcissist had a shoebox full of cash, right? Owed people, didn't pay them off, but had a bundle of money on her own. Welcome to narcissism. So she had plenty of money to do the things that she wanted. But since she didn't have any pressure to get a job, she didn't. And the weeks rolled into months and the months rolled by. And then the person was like, hey, are you going to find a job? Oh, yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking, that kind of thing. And it was very, uh, she did look a little bit after that, but like the Sunday paper. No, not anything really active. And that went on for a few weeks as well. And the, the we'll call her the landlord because although she's not renting out the house, asked, you know, hey, what's the deal? Are you still looking? Are you going to find a job? And uh, are you thinking when you're going to move out? And now because of the implied consent that the narcissist had that this was the deal and this is how they were going to live forever, the narcissist started to get a little pushy. You know, like, I don't like this. I don't like being questioned. I don't like being pushed around. I don't want, I don't, basically what the narcissist was saying is like, I don't like being held to fair standards. That's all right. Now, let's backtrack a little bit in our story and just what would a normal person do in this situation? Well, the normal person would say, oh, I'm sorry. I, well, first of all, the normal person would probably be looking for a job quite earnestly. 
But if they got lazy or distracted or needed some time to adjust, they would probably say those things. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I needed some time to adjust and I needed some kind of, you know, I, need, I needed to get my, my footing here before I looked for a job and knew where I, where I wanted to work and knew what I wanted my life here to look like. But the narcissist, of course, didn't do any of that. The narcissist just pushes back on everything. So the narcissist pushed back and I don't like being told what to do. I don't like being pushed around. I don't like being told that I have to work. I don't like being, mind you, this is not her house. She could be kicked out at any moment, right? But the narcissist played it off like they always do and eventually came to a head, right? Where the landlord asked her, you know, okay, you've been here three months. You haven't found a job. You could have found a job by now, maybe a few jobs by now, but it doesn't seem like you're trying too hard, but she didn't, she didn't say that. She didn't lay it down like that. She just basically laid it down like you've been here a long time and I'm going to have to set a boundary of, you know, three months. So in a couple of weeks, that's, you know, I think it was like three weeks. Trying to remember what it was. It was three something, right? I think it was another three weeks. You have another two or three weeks to move out. No, it was two weeks. Yeah, sorry. A lot of the edits I make on these things of me doing that. Um, so two weeks. Yeah, it was two weeks. And that's fair, right? She's been there three months. And the normal response to this is, oh, wow, I'm so sorry I overstayed my welcome here. Um, I'm terribly sorry. I will get my act together as soon as possible. I will go out there and I will find a job. I've been looking. I honestly, I, I'll be honest. I haven't looked as hard as I could. Um, but I'm trying to get my stuff together and I will definitely be out. And I, I really hope this doesn't injure our friendship that we're not going to, um, uh, get angry at each other and hold us against each other. I'm trying as hard as I can. And I honestly, every day I will be out there looking for a job. I swear. Right. And then they kind of patch things up between them. This is how it goes down with the narcissist. <laughs> Prepare yourself. It was screaming and yelling. And you can't do this to me. I can kick you out if I have to. No, you can't. I'll call the cops. You know, and it was all kinds of craziness. Name calling, devaluing, screaming and yelling. I hate you. I wish I never knew you. You're not my best friend. You're stabbing me in the back. And, oh, it was ugly. It was ugly. And uh, they didn't talk to each other verbally. Like, I think they might have said, you know, you have to verbalize to somebody living with you. Like, are you in the bathroom or something like that? Just, but anything above have to language, they didn't talk to each other at all after that. A narcissist is when they're done with you, they're done with you. So she was getting, a narcissist was getting her narcissistic supply mostly from her ex-husband. Why he was still in the picture, I have no idea, but why he would be willingly in the picture, I have no idea. So the narcissist, finally did move out and of course right then not before think about it the narcissist had two weeks to move out and to call in the flying monkeys but never did why because that would make things harder for the narcissist and not all narcissists call in flying monkeys to get something back sometimes they call in flying monkeys to get just get revenge and that's what this situation was so as soon as she moved out she got on Facebook, she got on whatever else she was on, <laughs> got on the phone and told everybody, trashed the person that did her a favor, helped her move, gave her a place for free for three months, trashed her, stabbed her in the back, told everybody that she was horrible, that, oh, I, I got kicked out, I got kicked out by the landlord. She's so, she's such a beast. She kicked me out. She didn't give me any warning. All of a sudden they were screaming and yelling. And next thing I know, I find myself out on the street with barely anything. I'm ba basically living out of my car. What am I supposed to do? How can you be friends with this person? That sort of thing. 
of course, Dot immediately got back to her. And she was shocked, right? You know, you did this person a favor, several huge life favors, and they just stab you in the back is not the normal thing to do. And that's what was done. So the flying monkey situation had commenced and it got back to everybody about how horrible this wonderful person actually was, right? And now this person didn't really, well, this person was upset at the fact that she was being maligned to all her friends that this narcissist knew. But it wasn't traumatic. It was upsetting. Um, but she actually did the right thing by um, coincidence almost. Like she just told the facts as they were and just dropped it like that. Because she didn't want to get in. She knew that instinctively trying to convert everybody to her point of view was not going to be good. Right? They were already against her. Her, her friends were now against her. Her friends had been changed into her enemies. So there was no going back from that. There's no real change. So she just told, you know, I let her stay here for three months, rent free, and then she stabbed me in the back. You know, <laughs> like this, telling everybody that I hate her, that I kicked her out. I didn't kick her out. I gave it two weeks, you know, rent free. But it is what it is. And so there was a lot of unfairness and a lot of hurt feelings. And the, the two never talked again. And they were best buddies at one time. Back in the day, they were best buddies. They hung out. They told each other every, all the secrets about all the, the stuff that they had going on with the boyfriends and money and stuff like that. So the no covert narcissist was out on her own and had burnt all her bridges to her former friend and had a box of cash. And she got a, a, actually a good job. Um, well, yeah, she liked it. Let's just say that. Keep it at that. <laughs> but she's out of the story kind of now. And you have the narcissist flying monkeys who stabbed you in the back. And where does that go? Well, about three months after that, one of the flying monkeys did come back and said that they, they were sorry. They shouldn't have gotten in the whole middle of it. And they just wanted to resume the friendship don't know how many people are going to do that. Now, the landlord in this case was like, okay, okay, but you know, well, she said, okay, but you know, and I know <laughs> it wasn't actually okay. She let the friend come back, but you know, you have to keep it to yourself that this is a provisional basis. You've been, if you were here at a friendship, now you've been dropped down to here, whatever that means. Because you have to be, it's a probational kind of thing. You can't open up to this person. This, the friendship has been ruined. Once a, a friend has become a flying monkey or a uh, family member, or whoever that is, it's downgraded forever. It never comes back because you can never really trust them. Not only do they still have a, con a contact with the narcissist and could become a flying monkey in the future, but also they have some kind of na naive quality that lets them be used by other people this person or another perhaps. So you have to downgrade it. You just have to reevaluate your situation and get more and better people into your life. And that's what the landlord did. So after about three months, yes, you have the initial, can I come back into your good graces with, from one of the flying monkeys. But at, over about a year, a few more of the flying monkeys came back and there were about 10 of them, maybe 15, I don't know. But we'll say, we'll say 10, a good round number. And I would say about three came back and apologized for taking the wrong side in the argument. Yeah. I don't know how they saw that was the case. But since communications are open with a narcissist, you can see how crazy they are. <laughs> you could see all the crazy-ish they get into. And you'll, uh, and some at some point, the bulb went on in their head. Right? And they went, oh, they were the trouble all along. Oh, I shouldn't have said what I said. Oh, I have to go back to that person. I have to apologize. I should have never said that. I should have never done that. What was I thinking? Right? Three out of ten. Now, there were another three who wanted to come back into the landlord's good grace. 
uh, just on a friendly basis, like this, they were kind of sorry for getting involved, but they weren't sorry for what they said and the position they took. Now that's completely on you if you want to let those people into your life again, but I'm, no, no. Maybe an acquaintance, like a, like a Facebook thing where you really don't care, they're in your friends list, and you, right? You know, you might have, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer in your friends list, who knows? There's crazy people in there. You know, well, cut that out. <laughs> Cut that out. Uh, but yeah, Facebook friends are not really friends. And you can keep them in there and they'll feel good about it. But you know to keep them on the back shelf. So I, I would say about three people really did apologize. One of them was a real heartfelt apology that made it up for everything that had been done to the person, the landlord, the person who had been good to the narcissist all along got stabbed in the back. No good deed will go unpunished with a narcissist. It won't happen because they see your good deeds as your weakness. Yes, and they use the implied consent thing. So if you put up with their BS, that's implied that you want more BS. So you have to drop it as soon as it happens. And if you are going to let anybody into your house, I would never let a narcissist into my house unless they were like an EMT and I was in need of medical care, right? I would never let them stay in my house. That's You're just asking for trouble. You're just begging for trouble because no, there's no amount of good things you can do that will make that situation turn out well. So, yeah, don't do that when you invite people into your house. And if, I mean, we can't do psych tests on everybody that comes into our life or, you know. So if you're going to invite somebody into your house, you have to lay down strict boundaries of time and acceptable behaviors. Strict, strict, strict. And they'll probably push them all. That's the way the people are. But narcissists, they're going to definitely push them all. Never allow a suspected narcissist. Like if you get a, if people are having a lot of complaints about a person, don't allow that person in. Even if you think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread, don't do it. You know the, the saying with a smoke this fire? Yes, this is basically the same thing. Just because you've never seen the fire doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right? The scorpion hides his stinger in the back, dude. He hides his stinger in the back. And when you see the stinger, it's coming around to sting you. And it's, that's when it's pretty much too late. Don't leave that open by having fuzzy boundaries. Narcissists love fuzzy boundaries. Solid, impeccable, unbreachable boundaries. Like you're not going to do it. You don't care. You'll gaslight yourself into whatever it needs to be in order to have those boundaries ironclad. They no, 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 no. I do not accept and we're not even discussing it, right? That's another trick that the narcissists use. They won't get you to discuss something and when you discuss something, it's open for debate. Another implied consent thing, right? You're debating it so it's up for grabs. Again, if you went uh, in the court system and questioned the judge a lot, you'd probably find yourself in prison. Why? Well, jail anyway. <laughs> because it's known there that questioning is a way of devaluing. When the narcissist questions you and gets you to explain, you're being devalued. You're being run down. Every time you try to get something into the narcissist's noggin was you being devalued. You can't get anything into their head. They're not listening to you anyway, so just drop it. So yeah, flying monkeys can come back into your life. Uh, they probably will. I wouldn't hold your breath on it, but they probably will. And uh, do you want them into your life is a serious question you need to be asking because they are they were used as a weapon and they can be used as a weapon against you in the future. And honestly, everything that you say, do, and are is probably going back to the narcissist at least 
in the short term during a flying monkey attack. And the narcissist may ask questions from time to time about you through the flying monkeys that they used, even though you don't realize that they're still being a conveyor of knowledge back to the narcissist. However, uh, you do get a few people, possibly if you're lucky, apologizing and giving honest apologies to you about their participation in your backstabbing. Right? There's no other way to say it. In their in the betrayal of you. And they realize if you're lucky, that they have betrayed you and that it was an actual betrayal. It wasn't just that they shouldn't have gotten in the middle of an argument. It's that they actually betrayed you. They betrayed your trust. They betrayed your friendship. And honestly, that can never be repaired fully. But you, will, you may have a few people who ask for that. And that's up to you. If they apologize for everything they've done, that is something I might, um, re I might uh, reconsider, and but they will be put on a back burner friendship. They'll never be as close as they used to be because obviously, um, once you break, you know what? What's the saying? Um, Trust is like fine china. Once you break it, you can never really put it back together again. It's like an egg. It's like an eggshell. <laughs> That's the saying. It's like an eggshell. Once you crack it, you can never put it back. You can put the yolk back in the egg. It's just, it's not worth it because they can be used again. And then you find yourself in a secondary devaluing experience of having to let people in that you're not sure. Build a new inner circle with people that have no contact with any of those other old people. Any of them, especially the narcissists, but any of them. And then you have this inner circle of people who value you, who get you get your situation and get your past relationships with your narcissist who can never betray you. So I hope this all helps. I know people want that to happen, want them, the narcissist flying monkeys to come back and apologize, and that can happen, and you can hang on that hope. But remember, it doesn't always happen. Just leave the door open for it, and if it happens, that's icing on the cake. So... This is really about us getting on to lead our best lives, so I hope that helps. I hope that gives people hope that are stuck in, an, in a narcissistic flying monkey attack because it's seriously debilitating psychologically, emotionally. And let's get on to live the best lives that we can live because that's what this is really about, getting on to live our best lives that we can live despite the craziness that we've been subjected to. Done.